further than anybody could have ever brought me. Amen. Y'all just pray for me. Amen. Praise the Lord. How many of this morning are thankful to be on the Lord's side? Hey, you could be on the other side. If you're on the other side this morning, I want to tell you, I hate to break the news to you, but you're on the losing side. I'm glad to be on the winning side this morning, on the Lord's side. We're going to be looking in our Bible this morning in the book of Mark chapter number 8. So if you have your Bible this morning, Mark chapter number 8. Now listen, I, I want us to remember this morning that we have to get out of the mentality that this is just another Sunday morning service, just another notch on the, on the wall or another notch in the belt. How many this morning believe that God can use this Sunday morning to be a paramount, monumental place in your life that could change you forevermore? If you come into this service by faith and you say, this is the grand opportunity, I believe today God can speak to you. I've had something on my heart for a little while now. And uh, the Lord, I didn't feel impressed. I didn't feel the leading of God to just go right in to dig and dig and dig. And because every once in a while, God will give me a message that I feel like that he wants me to rely more on the leading of the Spirit. And uh, not to say that at other times I don't, but there's just some messages that I may need to do a little bit more study so I can deepen my knowledge of what it is God's trying to give me. Sometimes God will give me a simple thought, which I believe he's done today. And more than anything, I need to rely on what the Lord has to share in my spirit. And that's what I want to try to do today with the help of God. But Mark chapter 8, verse number 34, we're going to start right there. While you're getting ready to get started, I want you to be prepared for this year. And in doing so, there's a lot of ways you might say what you want us to prepare, how you want us to do it. Well, I want you to be prepared for the fact that I, I want to experience some great things, and we're going to start trying with the help of the Lord to schedule and plan some different things for the church to be involved in. A few years ago, I, we, came, we had a theme, and the theme of that year was participation. And um, we could probably have that theme every single year and it'd be a good theme to have. Because last night I was, I was scrolling through a little bit there, and I noticed on my Facebook uh, feed, I noticed another church that, man, they were just rocking and reeling. Boy, they was having a move of God, and they were singing, and, and uh, there was, it seemed like the church, they, I don't know how many they run. There could have been 200 people, 300 people there. The majority of the people were up near the front of the church, and they were all just standing across the front of the church, worshiping and getting in and all of that. And when I looked at that, I paused for a second. I thought to myself, anywhere that you, anywhere you see the anointing of God and the participation of God's people, you're able to walk away and say, we had a powerful service. Everyone follow what I'm saying? Your participation is more important than you'll ever know. Because God, if God moves and everybody just stands back and nobody really participates, it's not as great of a demonstration. But whenever God's people react to the demonstration and the movement of God's Spirit, that's when you see the greatest things ever accomplished. That's when you see great things accomplished in God. And uh, I feel like God put this message on my heart for a reason and a purpose. But we're going to turn to Mark chapter 8. Verse 34, I'm stalling a little bit here. I have a reason. I'm a little troubled in my heart this morning. You pray for me, just a little troubled in my spirit. I don't know about you, but I'm just flat out sick of the devil, aren't you? I'm so sick to my guts with the devil and all his little foolish things that he does to prevent people from being able to hear and see and feel a good move of God. If you have it, say amen. I want you to pray for me this morning. The Lord will use me. When he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. 
For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels." This is what the Lord put on my heart. And I don't know if I got the title exactly, maybe the way the Lord wanted, I hope I do. But I think you'll get the point before it's over with. But I want to preach this morning on the roulette of the soul. The roulette of the soul. Sister Wilma, will you do me a favor? I want everyone to just bow their head. Sister Wilma, you pray over this service and pray real good this morning. Amen. You can be seated in the presence of the Lord this morning. Going to preach this morning on the roulette of the soul. Now, when we look at our text this morning, this is a familiar place for most of us. And where the Bible said, what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? If you've ever heard that before, raise your hand. Now, I've preached on this particular passage before. I've even preached this whenever I have dealt with funeral services and, and the passing of loved ones and that kind of thing, trying to reach for the people that were in that crowd. And uh, I, there's been a many a times God's gave me the liberty to talk about this. But I don't know about you, and I can't speak for you, but as I said a little bit ago, there's a lot of stuff that as I look around today really troubles me. During holidays and so forth, many of you experience the same thing, but when you look around, and Sister Tammy, you see that lost uh, friend or that lost family member or that lost cousin or nephew or whoever, sometimes it just has a way of really troubling you because you know the truth is if the rapture should take place, they're not going to make it. Now, if you can sit through and you can get around people and uh, family reunions and, and family get-togethers, and you see people that are lost, and you don't never think like that, you, you might need to get down on your knees and begin to pray because maybe you've lost your burden. But I, I get around people that I love, and sometimes, Sister Tammy, it, it really stirs something inside of me, and I get to thinking to myself, man, what would happen if on the way home today they lost their life? What if the next time that I see them, they're laying in a casket and we're doing their funeral? What if the next time that I hear the news about or their name brought up, it's to, for somebody to tell me, hey, did you hear the news? So-and-so got in a car wreck or they, they're eat up with cancer and they're given a couple of weeks to die or pass away. What if that was to happen? Because the truth is this morning that uh, in reality, a lot of times people face things and think, well, I'm never going to die and they really don't grasp reality that they could go out today or tomorrow or the next day and all that kind of thing. And, you know, I began to reminisce back to a few years ago. I hadn't long been saved. And, and when I really gave my life to God, I remember one morning that I went to church and the preacher got up and, you know, it seemed to me that when I first got saved, man, every preacher that was preaching was talking about the return of Christ, everybody. And they preached it in such a way that when you got under conviction, man, the hair would stand up on the back of your neck and you'd think, man, I better get down the altar and pray because I might not make it to home if the Lord should call my, the roll this morning, you know. And so I remember one morning the preacher got to preaching and, and and uh, he was preaching about heaven and sweet and hell hot and all of that. And, 
I remember I got into so much conviction, uh, Sister Barbara, and, and by the time that service was over with, the first thing that I wanted to do when I got done with that service and got up out of the altar, the very first thing I wanted to do, I had a family member that I loved so dearly. I knew they weren't saved. Uh, I wanted to make a beeline straight for their house, and I wanted to talk to them about the Lord, and that's exactly what I did. How many of us have got under such great conviction and got such a burden for the lost that we left the service and we forgot all about where we were going to eat at. We forgot all about what we were going to do that day. And the first thing we wanted to do was find that person and get a hold of their hand, look them in the eye and tell them about the coming of the Lord and encourage them to give their life to because anybody else felt that way ever before. But at that day, I left that service and I went straight to this relative's house. I, I, mem- I remember pulling up into the yard and as I was pulling up into the yard, I was so anxious and I was so excited, you know, about the opportunity to talk to them about the Lord. They happened to be in the yard and they were coming towards me. They seen me coming down the road. And as I was pulling up, I barely got it in park, already had the door open and before I could hardly say two words, uh, tears started flowing down my face. I got them by the hand and I said, I felt like that God wanted me to come over here today and I just want to tell you, I don't want you to be lost whenever the Lord comes back for his church. If you die tomorrow, I don't want you to be lost. Uh, I remember being so passionate. I remember them looking at me almost as if to say, well, you know, you don't really have to worry about me and you got them family members like I do. Well, I love the man upstairs uh, and all that kind of stuff. I love the man upstairs. That's why you never worship the man upstairs. Uh, I ain't even refer to him that way because to me, referring to him like the man upstairs like your landlord or something like that or, but, or some slum lord. but my God is not just the man upstairs. That's the problem with a lot of folks. Uh, he's upstairs. He's not downstairs. You understand what I'm saying? He's not in the heart. Amen. But I, it troubled me uh, because they just push it off. Uh, well, that's not me. That's not me. God's dealing with. Uh, but I got to thinking as I was riding down the road, coming back from Georgia, I, I, I got to thinking to myself how that people play this uh, roulette, if you will, with their soul. And they gamble every day. I got to thinking as I was riding down the road uh, and I was thinking about all the, the many risks and the chances that we take in everyday life. Some of them we have no choice, uh, but many of the risks that people take, they have a choice. And I got to thinking to myself uh, how that when you look at this particular text in the word of God, uh, the Bible shows us that Christ is calling men and women to come to him uh, and cast their lot with God and for them to worship and give their life completely to him. He gives the the contrast here. If you look at the text, you'll see it yourself. But he gives a contrast to the alternative of refusing or resisting God in your life and he shows them this invitation. In other words, come unto me, all you that are heavy laden. I want you to come and serve me. But if you don't serve me, he gives a contrast and, and the alternative if you decide you don't want to and he shows us here that even though that he wants us to be the the soldiers and the children of God and the heirs of God's righteousness if you don't choose to serve God if you don't choose to make him Lord of your life uh, the alternative is uh, that you're going to burn and perish most all of us understand and know that Uh, but he said in verse number 36 he said for what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Man, I, that just hit me in a way like it hadn't before. And I got to thinking to myself, when he said, what shall he give in exchange? In other words, what would you trade off? Is there something out in the world that is better than salvation? Is there some feel good? Is there some drug? Is there some high? Is there some lifestyle? Some popularity? What is it that you would trade your salvation for? Do you know the Lord said, a great example because exactly what the devil did to Jesus is exactly what he does to some of us. You see your friends living the high life. Amen. They stay up late at night partying and drinking. 
having their fun, get up, go to work. They seem like, man, they got a good living. They got this and they got that. But just like the devil did Jesus, he takes him up in one of the most difficult times of his physical life. He's fasting 40 days and 40 nights. He's in the wilderness solitary place. And he says, if you'll bow down and worship me, I'll give you this. Ain't that just like the devil? He wants you to trade what you have for what he says that you can have. I'm telling you this morning, uh, that's just how the devil works. Uh, And when we read our text uh, and the Bible said, what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? God is bringing us to a crossroad uh, and allowing us to decide, is there anything worth you taking that risk? Uh, Is there anything worth you taking that chance? Do you understand that a man can simply go down and I've seen it happen. I used to work at a convenience store as a teenager when I got up about 18, 19 years old. There were regular customers that came into our store and they would buy a quick pick, this pick, that pick, and fantasy something pick, and they'd sit there in that convenience store and says, Tammy, they'd scratch tickets. I'd have that gray stuff all over the counter. It'd be everywhere. They'd buy sometimes 200 to 500 tickets at a time. And then they might get one $50 winner, just enough for them to keep, you know, playing. That's how the devil works, right? Amen. So you have one night of fleshly feel good to the devil. He don't remind you what it's doing to your marriage. He don't remind you of what it's doing to your career. He don't remind you what's going to happen at the end of the payday, at the end of the row. He just reminds you the little feel goods along the way. So you scratched off 200 tickets and you spent $200 for 200 tickets and you get one, you know, one for $50 and you Oh God, I watch people come into that convenience store with their entire paycheck, go out buy 200 to 500 tickets for a dollar a piece or right around there. And when it was over with, they dwindled down, dwindled down, dwindled down until the last thing. They said, I can just give me five more. And they spent their entire paycheck in a convenience store on scratch off tickets. You see, in their mind, There was something worth taking a risk for. There was something they were willing to gamble for, something they were willing to lay it all on the line for, for the chance of winning it all. And I tell you, it amazes me that even in the face of the fact that there are good risks that we take. I mean, if you take a risk and you go down to downtown and you say, well, I might get mobbed, I might get beat up, but I'm gonna go downtown and preach to the lost. Now, you might take a risk and go down there and preach the gospel and somebody may get saved. You hear what I'm saying? Somebody may serve the Lord, but then again, somebody may not. But what if you go down there and take a risk and they do? You You see, not every risk is bad, but I'm here to tell you about the ones that you take every single day of your life and you push God off to the back burner and you never know if that day's your last. You never know which day it's going to be when your name, your turn on the wheel is going to be. You see, the more I got to thinking about this, I don't know much about roulette. I've heard the name Russian roulette. Anybody ever heard that? Some years ago, I had a preacher that I knew that preached a message. And he told a story about his nephew, I think it was, a cousin. His cousin was a young, handsome man with a lot of potential in his life. Got messed up by the wrong crowd. One night round a party. You know, it was the, it was the end thing to do to take chances. When you're young, a lot of times you take a lot more chances because you don't realize what's at stake. But he took, a uh, 45 caliber, if I'm not mistaken, revolver, put a, bear, a, a, a bullet in the chamber, spun the chamber, and put the gun to his head and pulled the trigger. And it just so happened that the bullet landed on the chamber that was at the very top. And when he pulled that chamber in front of his wife, in front of all of his family and different people that were gathered around that were foolish enough to partake in such a crazy thing, He blew his brains out right there in front of everybody. What a chance. What a risk. Right there in front of everybody, right there he lost his life just like that because of one risk, one little game of roulette that he was willing to play. 
Well, I didn't know a lot about roulette. I got to looking at this trying to better understand it. But that game of roulette goes back. You ever seen that round table that spins on a little axis and they drop a little ball on it? It's got like red and little black colors. I never played it. I don't know a lot about casino and gambling and whatnot. But they drop that little ball on there and when they spin that thing around and you cast a certain amount of money or bet on that, it depends on whether that ball lands in a certain place as to whether you're going to win. So the whole concept of roulette has everything to do with the chance or everything to do with the risk that you take. Well, I might win, I might not win. But you see, I found this about people when it comes to risk and chances. If the risk don't seem like a great risk uh, as opposed to the, the reward, a lot of times they're willing to take a big chance. You see, what do you mean by that, Brother Meyer? Well, for example, there's some of us, if you were driving down the interstate going 75 miles an hour, there's some here that would wouldn't even dare taking their hands off the wheel for even a second, right? So raise your hand if you wouldn't do that. If some of you have, maybe you had enough judgment, you thought, well, I'll take, it's all right, I'll grab the wheel real quick. Am I right? But if you were driving down the same interstate at the same rate of speed during a blinding rain, how many of you would take a chance to take your hands off the wheel? Let me see your hand. What I'm saying is, when you up the ante, when you begin to increase the odds, you're less likely to play a risk or to put a risk in. What that leads me to believe, I'm going to get right to the chase. It leads me to believe this morning that the people that take the greatest risk on their soul salvation and dying lost and, uh, and ended up in hell's fire, it shows me either one of two things. Either they really don't believe in God or either they really don't see there's a great risk involved. I look back to my own life before I got saved. And you know, for a long time, whether I realized this or not, I was going, I was banking on the, the idea that the rapture took place. I'd just fall down and pray real quick, and I'd be all right. You know, deathbed repentance or last-minute repentance. But God showed me, I'm not going to go into all that. I've preached it here before. God showed me right before I got saved that wasn't going to work. In a dream one night when I dreamed that the rapture was taking place, and I went to fall down to pray, and the trumpet sounded, and I missed out. God showed me that the risk that you're taking every day of your life, you're gambling. There's some of you would never stick a gun to your head and put a bullet in it. Why is it you take more risk with your soul than you would your own flesh? Come on, somebody. You want to gamble every day of your life. Huh? And you say, well, hey amen, it must not be. You must think it's not much of a risk. Your family must not see it's much of a risk because some of them would never take their hand off the wheel in a blinding rain. But yet, they go day after day after day not serving God. You see, if people give you a certain sense of comfort a certain sense of security, you might be more apt to take that chance. That's the reason why that I, I abhor this false doctrinal preaching and teaching about once saved, always saved. Because we're people are filling folks' head full of the knowledge or the idea that all you got to do is confess the name of Jesus one time, you can live like the devil the rest of your life, you're still going to make it to heaven. Well, true people that uh, may not be uh, Pentecostal in doctrinal ideology and theology, true uh, people of that mindset, most of them that go way back would tell you that if you're once saved, always you're going to live like you're saved and all that. I'm not here to get into all that, but I want to tell you this. Amen. People are willing to take a risk and a gamble with their soul because they get a sense of false sense of security that maybe somehow I'll make it. Maybe because my wife is saved because I had a grandmama or a granddaddy that was serving God. Maybe just somehow God's going to overlook my little situation and my set of circumstances. And I tell you, you'll die lost just like everybody else will if you don't give your life to God. Hey, man, if I handed somebody a gun this morning, lost as I don't know what, and I handed them a gun and said, pull the trigger, and there's only one bullet in the chamber, 
they would look at me and I'd be on Time Magazine, Washington News. I'd be on CNN and every other uh, news station. What a crazy preacher down there in Florida. But you know what's even crazier than that? Getting up every day of your life, living like a gambler, gambling with your soul. And my, this is very simple, but this is exactly what God gave me to preach. Living like a gambler every hour and every minute of the day. You roll the dice. And the more that you roll the dice, the more confidence you get. Huh? Let me show you the reason and the way this happened. See, I, was a, I like to play video games whenever I was younger. As I get older... I'm not so much into video games. I was pretty good at video games, and I'd always win levels and do stuff like that. I'm not so much into that now. Here a while back, I seen this little app on my iPad, and it was 8-Ball Pool. And I thought, well, I was, I was bored at the moment, so I, I clicked on it. Next thing you know, I'm playing 8-Ball Pool every day. A little here, a little there. You know what I found out? There's little bait things they do. They won't try to keep you playing the game. And I found out when you're, uh, you know, it's, it's virtual money that you're playing with. It's not real money that you're playing with. So you might have uh, 10,000 coins. So there's not a lot of risk. I'm not really going to lose no money and I'll still be able to pay my rent if I throw in, you know, 10,000 coins on this pool game and play thus and so and I play against, you know, whoever from the other side of the world. Just virtual pool you don't think nothing of it because there ain't much of a risk there. But I found out that there are different levels, different scenes. Boy, I'm, this is stupid. I know it is, but this is just me. I'm just being myself. Is that all right? There are different levels and different, you know, tiers that you can play. And you can play for 100. You can play the pool game for 200. But, but the more that the odds increase and you can go up like 20,000 coins, you can play against somebody else. The more that you run the risk, the less people are willing to take the chance. But I found this out. And it always tickles me if I play somebody and they've got one of those altered egos where they got to win everything and I, and I beat them and they'll say, let's play again. Huh? Can we play again? Because they don't like to lose. You see, the devil's got you playing this game of roulette with your soul. And the more that you play the game, the more confident that you get. And I'm going to tell you something about this game. Y'all ain't played it yet. I believe that some of that stuff is rigged. I do. Because the more that you start winning, you'll, you'll hit the same exact thing, the same exact way you did the last five games. And for some reason, that ball's going to scratch. I don't care what you do on the break. Hey Amen. I'm just telling you, that's how, that's how it goes. I, and, uh, and other people have said the same thing. I played it enough. I'm telling you, it don't make no sense. And so, but you know what happens? They know whoever's playing that game, they can bait you a little bit and you'll get aggravated while I'm going to play it again. Because what happens is you start getting bold. Ooh, I, just, I got a winning streak. I just won seven games in a row. And you know what you'll start doing? You'll get so bold well, I think I play on that pool table that they got like a 5,000 or 10,000, 20,000. And just as sure as you do it, the next thing you know, just as sure as you get on that first table, you'll be right on the break, hit a break, and an eight ball go in right here, or you scratch right on the first shot, and you go, how in the world? I was winning doing so good because the longer you stay away from God, I'm preaching this in a spiritual application, the longer a person stays away from God, the longer they stay continue in the life of sin without judgment in their life, the more bold they become. How do you know? I've seen it a lot. Well, God's judgment ain't came before. And I've preached this to you before and I want you to listen to me. You've heard me tell the story about Adam and Eve and about how Eve, when she took the fruit, and you've heard me tell this many times, but I want to remind you. You see, whenever Eve grabbed a hold of the fruit, when she looked at it, nothing happened. When she grabbed it, nothing happened. When she plucked it off the tree, nothing happened. When she pulled it down to her face, nothing happened. When she got it close to her mouth, nothing happened. When she put her teeth on it and started to bite it, nothing happened. But the moment that she put her teeth in it and took the bite is when it happened. 
You see, a lot of folks' problem is is because they pull it off the tree when they're thinking about doing it. They pull it off the tree. God's judgment didn't come. So they feel bold enough to pull it down to their face. Judgment didn't come. God didn't rain down fire. Family's still doing okay. Still got a few dollars in my pocket. So you pull it down to your face. Nothing's happened. So I'll I'll put it up to my mouth and take a bite and nothing happened. And so because all those nothing happened, they get bolder and bolder and you keep gambling and you keep playing roulette with your soul and taking chances. And I tell you, don't get so confident that you die lost because I'm here to tell you that you can die lost just like the devil can. Because of this, you put yourself in a position where you feel so confident that will never change the Bible. I don't care how bold you are. Doesn't matter how good you get at sin. Doesn't matter how good you get at hiding it. That change, thus saith the Lord. Never change it. Never change the word of God. I felt the Holy Ghost impress me to step out like this this morning and preach to you this way. You know why? Because sometimes just in the very simplicity of the preaching of the word of God, God is able to open up your eyes and show you what you've been doing for a long time. As I began to pray about this and God laid it on my heart, I realized it ain't just unconverted sinners that gamble with their soul every day. Backsliders do the same thing. I've seen people that have been backslid. They don't serve God. They won't turn their heart completely and fully, 100% toward God. The same people would never get in the car and purposely leave their child in the car seat unrestrained. Huh? The same people wouldn't take a lot of risk The same people may make sure that before they go to bed at night, they lock the door. But the same people, Brother Gaskins, will be the same ones to push God off day after day. Doesn't that worry, concern, scare some of you to know that people are taking such a big risk in their life? Because the sad thing is, sometimes what has to happen is the gun has to go bang. The apple has to snap and God bring judgment before people wake up enough to realize they've been playing games with God way too long. Do you know how many people that have died lost because they were playing around, playing around? You've heard different people tell stories. I think Brother Jeremy and him and I have talked about this before, about the young man that was called to preach, got on his motorcycle, ended up in the ditch, died, used to preach the gospel. And yet, that man got, he went in, they say the last thing that he bought with his credit card or whatever was a round of drinks for everybody at the bar. I guess that you get bolder and you get bolder, Sister Tammy, and you forget what kind of roulette that you're playing with your soul. But you see, the Bible gave us great value. Do you understand what the Bible's saying? I preached this at funerals, I told you that. But the Bible showed us the value of the soul when he said, what shall it profit a man if he gained the whole world? I want you to stop for a minute. You and I don't have the human capacity to comprehend the value and assets in the world. Think about all the billions and billions of dollars in all different levels of currency in the world. Think about the billions and billions of dollars of homes, businesses, electronic equipment. You and I don't have the, the capability of processing everything in the world. And there's no way, if you were to take all the money in all the world, all the assets in all the world, you couldn't, where would you put it all? But the Bible showed that your soul is more valuable Then if you were to take all the gold in Fort Knox, if you were to take every billionaire's assets and money and stockpile them, and if you found a way to put it all in the same place, the Bible said your soul is worth more than that. 
I read somewhere long ago about the billions that Apple's worth, the billions of dollars that Samsung is worth, the billions of dollars that mega corporations like Windows, uh, places like Walmart, please, all these big, big corporations. But God said, your soul's more valuable than all of that. And yet there's some of you, you wouldn't put $20 on a stock that you thought might fall. There, I don't know much about stocks and bonds and all of that, but very little. And there's something like Brother Benefield. If you thought for one minute that you were going to transfer $100 into something that you think might crash next week, would you do it? No. And most people wouldn't do that if they thought that it was going to crash. They're not going to waste their money and throw it away because the risk. You see, but there might be some of you that somebody may come along and tell you, say, well, this stock right here, we expect it to rebound, okay? So you contemplate it, and as long as the risk isn't that much, you might say, well, I'm not going to put as much into this one as I'm going to put over here in the Sam's Club, or I'm not going to put as much. I'll, I'll put how about $5 in that one, and I'm going to put $100 over here in, in McDonald's restaurants or whatever it is. So you put because the risk is not that great. Do you understand what I'm telling you this morning? People don't value their soul because if they did, they would understand the risk is not worth the penalty of judgment. You, you, it's a sad day when we value the money in our pockets on paper and ink more than we value the soul God gave us. Man, I don't know how much I can preach this any better or show you any other way. You have played games with your soul. You got the most valuable thing on planet earth. A soul. Are you willing to jeopardize it and trade it for the popularity, all the money? I don't know. What, do you, what, what, what would it be? What would you trade or exchange for your soul? Is there anything worth risking it? You know, if anybody could get a hold of what I'm saying, and there was a sinner, they would see the risk is not worth the penalty. And they would get in the fold of God. The backslider would come home. Let me tell you, it's not just sinners and backsliders that are in trouble this morning. We have got a ton, a boatload of lukewarm saints on the pews of God's church. Are you, are you sure about that, Preacher Myers? Yes. We're willing to risk and take chances of not having a prayer life. And then we get in a situation where we can't even pray off a headache because our, we're not constant in prayer. We don't, like, we don't uh, obtain the power and retain the power of God in our life. Uh, and then when we really need God the most, uh, we're in trouble the most. Uh, I've often said, I'd hate to be in a place in my life uh, where if I got a phone call and they said, is this Joe Myers? I say, yes, uh, we need you to come down to a certain location. Your wife is just in a bad accident. I don't want to be so lukewarm that if I showed up to my wife's hospital bedside, that I didn't have the prayer life to pray for her in an emergency time of need. Because the moment that you slack and you risk everything for something else, what is it? Is it worth that much? That'll be the very day that I'll need to pray for one of my children, to pray for one of my family members, or to maybe pray the final prayer over someone before they slip out into eternity. God forbid if I go down there to that nursing home where Sister Charlotte is and I lay hands on her to pray for her that my life is not what it needs to be and I can't get a prayer through when she's counting on somebody to pray for her when she's not able to even speak words into the air or to God. What I'm telling you is is that people are taking great, great risk I don't even like the idea. I've got a fenced-in backyard. I don't even like the idea that when I come home, where is Justin anyway? Amen. I don't even like the idea when my son gets his bicycle out of the backyard and he leaves the side gate open. I don't even like that because when I come home and Sister Wilma, I see that side gate open, a lot of things go through my mind. I wonder if somebody might have tried to get in or whatever. I, I wouldn't go to bed at night 
Not in the crazy world we live in today. Now, if I was living up in the mountains of Kentucky somewhere, out in the middle of nowhere, it might be a different story. But I wouldn't go to bed at night with my window wide open. First of all, mosquitoes would carry you off. Second of all, yeah. Second of all, some other, some other crazy might come in your house and carry you off. I wouldn't do it because I love my family too much and the risk is not worth it. Why is it that you'll park your car in the Walmart parking lot and make sure you lock the doors but gamble with your soul? Am I still preaching? There's some of you, if, if you found something on Craigslist you really like, and the guy said, well, I'm not going to be able to show it to you. I'll just mail it to you, a sight unseen. You haven't seen it. You just heard about it. There's some of you said, no, I need to see what it looks like. I need to know if it really works. Huh? Sight unseen. Some of you said, oh, it's... But listen here. If a guy told you that he had a $250, whatever it was, and he said, well, I'll give it to you for $5, and it was sight unseen, you might go, well, the risk not that great, so I might try it. Huh? Well, I'll give it to you for $1.50. You might say, well, $1.50, that ain't nothing. That's exactly where I don't. Well, I'm not preaching this all right because I really hope this is coming across good. That's exactly where people are with their soul. They don't realize the value of their soul, so they're like that guy. Said, "Well, if it's only a dollar fifty, I'll take that risk." If you only understood how close to death's door we are every day, 24 hours a day, and you realize the value of your soul, you would never take chances with it. I don't know about you, but this worries me. I'm concerned about a lot of folks. Somebody say, help us this morning. Amen. I found that there are so many people that are not willing to risk a lot of things in their life. But the same people are willing to jeopardize their soul that God has given them. You see, for somebody to overlook the risk of their life, they typically weigh the consequences in their mind and they consider whether or not that it's a small chance of them falling victim to something or it's just few and far between. Why else would somebody gamble with their soul? Why else would somebody take a chance? Sister Barbara, I think it's because they don't realize. Or maybe they had some family member or somebody that came along and helped them justify their sin. I want to share this and I'm going to try to close here because I'm just trying to follow the leading of the Spirit of the Lord this morning more than anything. I want to give you some advice whether you take it or not. First of all, the people in your family, in your lives that are lost or backslid, don't ostracize them or act as though they're not a human being. I know that when people are backslid and lost, they, they pull back, draw back, and sometimes they use, they just, well, nobody's having anything to do with me when in all, in fact, they don't want anything to do with you because you don't have common interest anymore. I understand that. But don't ostracize people just because they may not be saved or where they need to be. That's foolishness. You talk to them with love and respect just like you would anybody else. But at the same time, I'm going to give you some advice. Don't give people a false sense of hope. What if I was, a, I'm going to put it this way. Is anybody here, there's some of you, that if you went to Disneyland, you might get in that little teacup ride because there ain't a lot of risk. It don't go way up in the air, and if you fall, you ain't got to fall very far. Am I right? Huh? Some of you might get in a teacup ride. The one for the three-year-olds. If you can fit in it, you would get in that. But if I'm the engineer of that big ride way up in the air, and I say it's been through this safety inspection, this safety inspection, and it's been through so many things, and we've made sure we've gone through it a humpteen dozen times. We test it three or four times a day, blah, blah, blah. If I was to go through the process of assuring you that it's okay, you're more apt to get on that ride and ride it. Am I not right? When you give your family a false sense of security like they're saved when they're really not saved, you're not doing them any favors because they're going to continue to stay on that ride. What do you mean by that? Now, I know this may not be popular, but I'm going to preach this anyway because it's good advice. You can still love your family without making them think, well, you're okay, honey, because I hear a lot of times, She's a good guy. She's a good gal. He's a good guy. Oh, they're so sweet. They love God. They really do love God. Let me tell you something. 
I'm not talking. There's a lot of people that I believe in in a lot of ways really love God. But if they were really genuinely where they needed to be, this ain't going to be popular. There would be a lot of things in their life that are not like they are right now. And they would prove that love through their desire, their determination to serve God. I know that's not a popular thing to say. But when you start making excuses for your grandbabies and start making excuses for your family, well, they're a pretty good old gal. Well, the truth is, Brother Myers, I think that they, they got 25 Bibles. They might have 125 Bibles. But if they're not applying, listen, I'm not trying to be me, and that might go against the grain, but you better listen to me. The reason why some of our family is where they are is because you painted a picture. Well, baby, mama loves you. Well, baby, daddy loves you. And you're pretty close to God. You just need a little help. When the truth is, like Sister Wilma said, they need to be born again. Come on, somebody, need to be saved. Need to really get saved. Because when a man gets saved, all things are passed away. And behold, all things are new. What I'm telling you this morning is you can do your family an injustice by insinuating they're okay when they're not okay. I'm not talking about going into somebody's house, walking in the front door, and they say, want a piece of pecan pie, and you come in the eye and say, you're We've had enough of that nonsense in the church. I'm talking about when God opens up the door of opportunity that with Scripture, you can allow them to see you're not where you need to be. I was telling a story the other night about that woman that nearly wrecked my life. Meanest woman I ever met called herself a Christian. She stood outside the church doors one day. She was talking, We were talking about witnessing, you know, outreach ministry. And, and uh, I was talking about being fishers of men. I said, you got to, you know, you got to uh, do it this way and that way and really reach for people's soul. She stood there and she looked at me. She said, hmm. she said, I quit baiting the hook a long time ago. She said, I used to put the bait on the hook. She said, but people are so stubborn, they don't want to listen. I just got tired of baiting the hook. I just beat them with a fishing pole now. At least she was honest. We don't need any of that same out. But if you give people that you give people the idea they're ready and they're not, or you live your life like they might be ready, you ought to you ought to look at it like this. If you know within your soul you that doesn't bear witness to you that they're not really where they need to be, honey, stop playing games with their salvation. Get down and pray and start asking God to get a hold of them and save them to the uttermost. Somebody say amen. Because if you keep living your life like they could be saved or they probably are saved, everything you do, everything you say, you're going to put off an air like, well, you probably are. I don't know if this is going over well this morning. I'm just trying to obey God the best I know how, but I'm, I'm pouring my heart out to you. Riding down the Interstate 75, it got a hold of my heart while I rode down the road, and I started thinking about the many risks that people wouldn't take in this life, but yet they risked their own soul. Is that you this morning? Huh? Sister Miranda, you'll play the piano for Brother Myers this morning, please, and sing. Sister Cindy, I'm just like you are. I got loved ones that I really, really, really would like to see them get good and saved. Genuinely give their heart to God. Not this half in, half out stuff. Not I might go to church next six months. I might go to church. But I'm talking about 100% sold out for God. I got family just like you do. And it's hard whenever you start thinking they might die lost. But you know what I'm doing as a pastor? I'm going to start praying this. as I haven't prayed like this in a while. But I'm going to start praying that God will wake you folks up with a burden for the people that you haven't prayed for like you should have. And put a passion in your heart to see them saved. And if it takes it to show you visions of what it'll be like if you have to embrace the idea that they die lost, I'm going to pray whatever it takes. Because the thing is, folks, as a people, we got to get down and seek the face of God for those that are not saved. We can talk about shouting. We can talk about running. We can talk about all the Pentecostal distinctives in the Pentecostal movement. But Sister Tammy, if souls are not getting saved, the truth is we're not much Pentecostal at all. 
I want to start seeing, Brother Gaskins, don't you, you believe with me? I want to start seeing people getting saved across these altars in 2016. I've had times in my ministry where day, where we were in a, in a revival and every single day at least one person was getting saved in a revival. I've seen times before where there were several that got saved at one time. I personally, Sister Wilma, I believe that the church will get serious about this. We can see people getting born into the kingdom of God. But you and I have family members this morning that are, that are gambling with their soul. They're playing roulette with their soul. You and I have family members that would never send their little six-year-old out there on their bicycle to, to ride out there without a helmet or elbow pads or some training wheels, and they don't even barely know how to ride a bicycle. Some of us would never do that. But yet with our own life, this came to my mind. I want to share something personal with you and be transparent. Is that okay? I think the best thing a preacher can do is be honest in his own life. My wife and I have talked about this many times. But in all honesty, Brother Jeremy, I've had times before when I shouldn't have, but I was riding down the road texting while I was driving. And my wife would get on to me and say, Honey, please put your phone away. But you see, what happened is, I got real good at driving and texting at the same time. So I get confident. So I think, well, I'm okay. I, you know, I've probably sent 10,000 text messages and I've never had a problem. But I've also had times before where that I was looking down at my phone, just glancing at my phone and says, Tammy, I looked down and looked back up and I was kind of veering off the side of the road. And I, and I get a hold of myself. I'm like, you got to stop texting, dummy. Anybody ever think that way about yourself? And so that little monetary, y'all listening to me because this really applies. This is what the Spirit of God showed me. That little monetary little wake-up spell. And so you know what you do? Anybody that's ever done this, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It could have been a cell phone. It could have been you were reading a book. I've seen people putting the makeup on going down the road. It could be anything. But the moment that you have a close call, what do you usually do right then and there? What's the first thing you usually do? You set it down. And you act like you're never going to do it again. Because it really scared the daylight. So you put it down. Oh, Lord Jesus. And you're thinking... It'll be 45 minutes, an hour later, and you're still thinking, you know, it's on your mind about that phone. But eventually, that starts to wear off. Somebody calls you, oh, I got to answer that. I really need to answer that one phone call. I really need to respond. So you pick it back up. I'm going to just make a quick one. I'll just make a quick, you know, okay, okay, or K. Right? That's exactly what I've seen people do in this church house and in the ministry for many, many years. They're gambling with their soul every day, Sister Barbara Helms, and then they come to church or they have a place in their life where they have a real close call. They nearly lose their life or God shows them something by conviction in a church service and God really gets hold of their heart. And in that very monetary minute, they're thinking, I will never do this again. I'm really going to start doing right. But give it some time, and the next thing you know, they're back doing the same thing they was doing before. Somebody said it a while ago. I hope this never happens to me. But all it takes is one time. That one time that you ain't paying attention. That one time where you think you got it. And there you go out in eternity, or you call somebody else to die. Is that what it's going to take? Because a lot of us have had little wake-up calls. God's giving you little convictions. He's convicting the altar service here, conviction altar service there. There's got to come a point in your life where you realize the value of your soul. There's got to come a point in your life where you realize the risk that you're taking every day and that if you don't stop dead in your tracks and start making some new headway, you might be facing a demise pretty soon in your own life. Stand all across the house. There's some of you this morning, you know exactly where I'm preaching from. Exactly the examples that I've given you. Some of us have allowed ourselves to get in a, in a habit of prayerlessness. 
in a habit of not being faithful to God in our tithes and offering, faithful in our, in our life and dedication to God, to the house of God. There's some of us that have been absolutely unfaithful to God. And I want to share something with you. I want you to look this way if you're not praying. I want you to listen to me. You have the ability within yourself because of what Christ did on the cross to change your tomorrow. Sister Wilma, I'm sure that there are people right now, if they could, would do anything to be where I'm at instead of sitting in jail because of the decisions that they've made. I bet you, I I hate to use that word, but I'll tell you this. I believe that there's most likely people in hell's fire this morning that would give anything to be where you're at to have one more opportunity to pray in a service like this. Don't let the devil distract you. Don't let the devil keep you from doing what you know you need to do right now. Get down on your face and say, God, I'm giving it all to you in this altar. It's 2016. God, let this be one of the greatest years of ministry. Let this be one of the greatest years that I've ever had as a person, as a child of God. Some of you need to make some rededication before God. Some of you need to sell out with God and pray like you've never prayed before. You let things come between you and God and your relationship ain't what it used to be. There's some of you got family members that you used to really pray hard for them, but you don't pray for them like you used to. There's some that you had a burden for, but you haven't prayed for them much anymore. Is it because that you believe that they're really going to be okay and they're going to be saved with others, whether you pray or not? Have you lost your burden? I'm telling you this morning, the greatest thing Grace Street Church of God can accomplish is to see souls saved and born into the kingdom of God. The greatest thing that you could see this year in 2016 is those lost, backslid, compromised, lukewarm family members or yourself get back to where you need to be in God. Come on, let's pray. Come on, let's pray. Go ahead and sing something, Sister Miranda, if you can, baby, please.